important because she has done she has actually done all of this and it is evident in the impact that she's been able to make through rapid leaders um and so i'll hand over to her and she will be able to tell us a bit more um, about her, her her journey uh as well as take us to uh about two hours of uh of, of the master class so welcome esther the floor is yours Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of us. It's very nice to be here. I'm grateful to God for the privilege and the opportunity to be speaking to us. Um, and I'm looking forward to an impactful session for myself and for all of us. I will welcome all of us. If any of us would like to have the cameras on, please feel free to do so. I was telling Eric earlier, I enjoy seeing people's faces, but I understand the logistics behind that's not always possible. But if you're able to, please feel free to switch it on. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. This has been an interesting build up. I will give us a bit of background and then I'll start the session. Um, I think. Angie and I've had the privilege of spending some time with Angie over the last few weeks and it's been such an honor to just hear from her fresh, learn from her and it, I know she's not here but I just want to honor her for the vision that God has given to her and the obedience with which she walks. Um, she asked me I think to do this session about a year ago, maybe a year plus and I remember thinking you're already seeing 2022. And by then I had not even started seeing half of that year. I think it was 2021, early 2021. But that's who she is. God shows her head and she obeys. And I remember I was, knew I was going to be in New York. So, and I'll explain why I'm in New York. What I did not know is I was going to be in Las Vegas. I will also explain why I'm in Las Vegas. But I think each of those nations represent a conversation that we're going to be having today, which is around movement and movement. And just in effect aligning with God's move. Um, to give us a bit of background around what I do, why I do it, and where I am at, at the moment. By training, I'm an accountant. And so I started my career with Quite House Coopers um, in Kenya. I worked with them for about eight years, two years of which was were in United Kingdom. And I was doing a secondment in a place called Leeds. And I, I still remember that assignment because I remember finishing my secondment in 2012. And I remember having a conversation with God. I did not like UK and have very open conversations with the father. And one of the first things I asked was in 10 years, can we revisit whether I like the rest? <laughs> what I didn't know was it was not an unreal conversation. Literally in 10 years, God lifted me and brought me to this land. And so worked in UK for about two years, went back to Kenya, worked with WC for another one more year, joined a bank, worked as the head of risk and compliance for about two years. And in 2014, heard from God that it was time to move as he was moving. And the assignment was to build an, a leadership development program for young people, a program that would ignite their progress. And nowadays we say it's ignite their progress and ultimately an, uh, enable them to imagine the possible. And so in obedience, in naive obedience, I always say that I'm not sure if I would do move with the same speed I did. I probably still do in different ways, but I find that God works with naive obedience and in this naive obedience in 2014, I left a bank, I left a job as the head of risk and compliance. I left a very well-paying assignment. I remember when I was leaving, people thought that I just needed to change back. And one of my very good friends called me and told me, I still have got a new role as a director in Barclays. You will make XXX come. So I, I told him no. And in obedience moved into forming Lapid. And the last eight years have been nothing close to what I imagined I was going to be stepping into been greater and harder and greater <laughs> and and so that journey of 2014 to 2022 was exactly that god kept his word i have many stories that i won't get into of moments where i saw this is my assignment i remember one of my first cohorts had worked very hard to get a cohort in my first cohort and got about 30 leaders, exceptional leaders into the room. And when I went to the second cohort, I didn't feel that I had 
the people that I wanted in the room. In fact, I remember in the morning of that class, about two people showed up and I was in the toilet and I was asking God, I've delivered the last one month, I resigned jobs and there are two people in this room. And I will never forget what God told me. He told me, I will build my house. No gates of hell will prevail against me. But I remember having the clarity that God built his work. And our job is to walk in obedience. And that affirmation is what I live by even today. Um, and over the last few years, we are now headed to close to 800 people that have walked in to the uh, flagship program that uh, we, were, we have built over those eight years. We have students, alumni who are building programs in South Africa. I have a student who is in um, Soweto and doing some phenomenal work there. I have a student who is in Burundi who is doing phenomenal work there. I have a student in Nigeria who does some work in the music industry. I'm trying to understand, but I'm yet to understand. I have a student in Tanzania who does some phenomenal work, I have amazing community in Kenya. And I consider it such a great privilege that God allows me to be at the forefront of the work that he's doing in each of those people. And I say that uh, with a lot of joy, humility, but also consciousness of the journey. 2018, I was exhausted and I was going to close shop. I actually announced that I have raised 350 leaders. Those are enough. The father can use them to do what he needs to do in Africa. That all is used to disciples. And around then, God, uh, caused me to sign up for PLF. And a lot of my friends had done PLF many years before, but I move at the speed of God's assignment. And I remember hearing very clearly it's time. Let me go and do this thing. And I remember walking in and the assignment, the theme for my cohort was kingdom expansion. I need rest. Why are we talking about kingdom expansion? And I'll never forget many Many times a pep Angie would come bring, I think, please don't mention expansion. <laughs> and I wasn't, I was tired. Um, and I see some people that I that were just part of that journey. I was honestly exhausted, but I kept hearing the nations and it, I kept panicking. <laughs> but God did the work of restoration as he did with Elijah and as he does even today. And in 2019, I was back and got the first. Um, the fellowship got an award by the Obama Foundation and the Obama Foundation and we were having a conversation in Vegas around this. They got about, they say they got about 7,000 applicants and what they were looking for was 20 civic innovators. People who are passionate, but more importantly, committed to the movement and innovating in the civic space. And I was, by God's grace, one of them. And we had three Africans. I was the only Kenyan an Egyptian and a Malawian. And I was the only African woman. And after we were done with our cohort, we were done with the fellowship. And that's how the father works. He creates things for his children <laughs> because literally we finished and they closed. Um, and then in 20, and that did many interesting things. And in 2020, I think, yes, 2020, when COVID started on March, I will never forget we in Mount Kenya University, but I'd released funds for us to run a program there. There was an assignment that is for Thika that I will not get into. And that same day, I got a letter from Oprah Winfrey Foundation, and they ran a fellowship where they pick one woman who is in the public service space, and by God's grace, I'd been selected for it. And so that's how I ended up in New York. It's called African Women in Public Service. They have a collaboration with New York University that ends up being an executive master's in public administration. My mother is passionate about governance. And when I was growing up, I had this thing that said, I don't want to do governance because it is hard. And that the father would choose. He eventually say, as it's time to move to public service um, is something that is just God's story. And so I've been there since August. Um, this past week, we have been in Las Vegas, which is just God's story as well. Um, we were launching a movement, and this conversation is about movements. We were launching a movement around climate summit. And so actually the summit we were holding was a collective leadership in climate summit. 
And we're expanding the conversation for climate just beyond climate because climate has been used as an elitist conversation. But climate conversations are around democracy, they are around entrepreneurship, they are around access. And so we spent this week with phenomenal leaders. <laughs> and we'll be, we're being hosted by, I, I can't describe this because it's a bit hard to describe it. Where we were staying is places I have watched on TV and as a child. And even then I understood what I saw on TV. We're just phenomenal leaders in Las Vegas. And the conversation was, how do we as civic innovators challenge them to think differently? Even more importantly, how do we challenge ourselves for well, the move of God is here? I was having a conversation with Brokers earlier that this is the last time we preached with her um, was on a conversation on soul, David and Solomon. One of the first things that she said that has stayed with me is we're in the middle of a mega shift. And I have no doubt in the middle of a mega shift. And the way that God is moving is very divine. And so that's where I want to spend, start this conversation from. Then you will allow me to pray one more time and just, um, just invite the spirit of God afresh into what I'm going to be talking about, um, that he may lead. And so you'll allow me to just pray one more time. And I guess if he asks that we pray again in the middle of it, that's what we will pray again, because God's work is built on prayer. <sighs> Father, we, we are humble, the Lord, in your greatness, Lord, you choose to use men and women, Father. And so, Lord, we decrease and we ask that you may increase. We invoke your power in this conversation, Lord. That, Father, it's not by power, nor by might, but by your spirit, Lord, that we will talk about movement, movements, and building an operational excellence, God. I desire for your Holy Spirit to speak in me and speak through me. And so I invite your presence here, Lord. I come against any spirit that's not of you, anything that has elevated itself above your name, I bring it down in the name of Jesus. I sanctify my words, my space, this internet with the blood of Jesus, and we raise an altar, Lord. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. That breathe your power, breathe your presence, breathe your purposes into this conversation, Lord. God, our desire more than anything, Lord, is that your kingdom come and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, your word tells us that the kingdoms of the earth have become the kingdoms of our Lord. And Jehovah God, I take authority over this space in the name of Jesus. And I decree and declare that the kingdoms of the earth have become the kingdoms of our Lord. Release your spirit, Lord. Speak in me and speak through me, Lord. Father, I will not stand in the way of what you desire to speak through your children, Lord. And Father, even for each person who is here, God, there be anything that God dishonors you, Lord, forgive us. And let your Holy Spirit, your sweet spirit, over in this place. Your word tells us that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so I release freedom in this call in Jesus' name. But there's a bondage in the church of fear that keeps us small. I rebuke that spirit in Jesus' name. And I ask that, Lord, you release your freedom, your power, your love, your sound mind into this conversation. Let your kingdom come, Papa. Let your will be done in this call as it is in heaven, Lord. I submit, Lord, you and what you desire to do in this call. The way spirit of God I am. In Jesus' name, amen. And this conversation is anchored on three things. Um, and so it will have three parts. <laughs> and let me just be upfront and say it will be a bit of a heavy session. Uh, I have asked God, do we have to do all three? Uh, 
The answer is yes, but we've tried and figured out how we go about it. And so we will go through three things. We'll talk about movement. There's no movement without movement. And so we'll talk about movement. Um, and as I talk about movement, I pray that you hear freedom. I hear freedom heavily. Mm. And I will just pray that there's, that there's freedom in this call. Um, and so freedom and movement have to move together. So movement and then movements. Then movements are formed from movement. And then how do we build with operation excellence? And, and the first part that we're going to go into is around movement. And so let me just say that I got this one <laughs> early in the year. When we run cohorts in Lapid, we generally ask God for a verse that anchors that cohort. And this was the verse that we got for the cohort that we started this year with, which was Arise and Walk. But the most interesting thing that happened for me was I was in the ILS, International Leadership Summit, um, that Bishop Jakes runs. And literally, this was almost the same word that he released. I was not sure. I still had the authority to keep going with it. But it's God's word. And so I, I will go with it. Uh, but if you were part of ILS, there's some bits of it you will have had. But I sense that it's a word for all of us. Arise and walk. A master class ordinarily is very technical. I will start with us reading God's word. Um, but as we do that, I want to also speak towards a theme that's running through our year, which is courage is calling. Um, every year we sit with a year theme. Clearly, we are theme people. And the theme that God gave us this year was courage is calling. The decade, this decade is about reimagining the possible. And the first thing that God uh, gave us was you can't reimagine the possible unless you answer the call of courage. And courage is about doing it afraid. Courage is about the freedom to say, I don't know. Courage is about vulnerability. Courage is about crawling your way through things that you're not sure of. And so courage is calling is still part of what we talk about as we, as we think about arise and walk. So I've mentioned that this is what I'll go through. Movement, building movements and operational excellence in movement. I want to spend the first 20 minutes around movement, perhaps shorter than that. Um, and see how God leads us towards building movements and ultimately operational excellence in movement. I'm excited mostly about building movements, uh, perhaps because I think that's a bigger thing at the moment, but I am conscious of God's process. And so I want to anchor this conversation on a verse, and you will allow me to read it. And if you have your Bible with you, we will read it together. And the verse that we're going to be reading is Acts 3, 2 to 8. I will do a lot of water throughout this session. It's very hot. And I feel like I have been up and about a lot. And so water will be my friend. But I want to read 3, 2 to 8. Um, and I will use this. And I will just highlight a few things even as I read them. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into temple courts. This, this verse is the message. A man who was lame from birth, lame from birth, lame from birth, was being carried by good people carried to the temple gate. And the temple gate was called beautiful. And they put him there every single day to beg. <laughs> beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money because he thinks the thing he needs is money. And Peter, by the wisdom of God, Peter looked straight at him. He sees through him. He sees through the request for money. He sees him. And so Peter looked straight at him as did John. And may God send us men and women who look straight at us. 
And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention. He needs his attention. Because you can't build movements with people who haven't seen you. And so you must ask, how do I get the attention of the lame men that God has called me to serve? And so for Peter, they told him, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. In some spaces, it says, arise. Silver or gold, I do not have. Even as we run this session, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And this is a word for someone. Walk. In him by the right hand, he helped him up. And version say, he yanked him up. <laughs> and instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. The word of God. He jumped to his feet. He has to do some work. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Movement is not just inspiration. You need to jump to your feet and walk. Then he went with them into the temple court, walking and jumping and praising God. An evangelizer had been born. Arise and walk. I want to highlight a few things. The one movement is a prerequisite for movements. That as long as we are stuck at the gate as lame men and women, we cannot build movements. And this is my conviction. Africa needs to walk. When I was studying Lapid and around early 20, the 2010, there was a big move around Africa rising. And many people had Africa rising as we are poor, let's gain wealth, all those things. And it was. But more than that, Africa rising is an identity question. That as Africa heals its identity and wakes up from its lameness, we will heal the world. There is, as we're talking about climate, I just was moved by how much the African context is relevant for this climate crisis. If we even just borrowed the philosophy of Ubuntu, and exported it to the world. There's somebody we are working with to do some work around that. He heals the world in such a big way. We have to move. I remember when I landed, we used to do a lot of COVID tests. Every week there was a test. And I remember walking into hospitals and finding a lot of African nurses. And it's because of that time when a lot of Kenyans and a lot of Africans moved from Africa to this land to be nurses. And I remember hearing from God. Africans are healers. That the reason we are nurses for this land, it looks like just an accident, but it's a positioning of God to heal the world. But we have to move. And so movements, movement is a prerequisite for movement. And where is God calling you to work? Movement. Where do you need to move? And I want to talk about three things in movement and talk about them really fast, but request that you reflect on them. Movement as self-growth. Movement in terms of mentors, movement in terms of. I want to start with the first one of self-growth, which is spoken about in Act 3 2. This man was lame from birth. And what I hear from that, now a man who was lame from birth is it was a permanent or a seemingly permanent situation. But lame from birth is not a permanent judgment in God's kingdom. This guy, he was born lame. His story was most likely written and done because he was lame from birth. But in God's kingdom, 
lame from birth is not a permanent judgment and break. And the reason I love that is there are spaces in my life, there are spaces in my family, there are spaces in my calling that feel like I have been lame from birth. And I hear God telling me, lame from birth is not permanent judgment. I can break free. Are there family issues? Do you have issues of indiscipline? That when you look at yourself, your whole life, you've started things, you've not been able to finish them. Do you have issues of financial discipline or even generally financial constraints from birth? I make fun with the fellows I work here. A lot of them have $10 million budgets. I tell them, you guys, do you know where I come from that if you tithe those 10 million, I tell them in my brain, actually, I would be doing a lot more. And it's a, a, a lameness around financial constraint. But nothing is permanent in God's hands. God sees them as temporary things, but sometimes we make them permanent. I have been lame from. What have you and your family made permanent? And God is waiting for you to arise and walk. That's the first question I hear for us. What in my family have I made permanent? In what space do I show up every day and say I have been lame from birth? And yet God is waiting for me to arise and move. The second thing I want to highlight from that past. Actually, it's still within the movement of self. The reason we stay lame is we have enablers, good people, who enable our begging. Hey, let me tell you how Africa remains poor. <laughs> remain poor because we have leaders who are colonizers by state. And every five years, they tell us we do elections. Those things are lies. But they enable us to keep begging. Well, the world is thinking in 100 years terms. You know, in Kenya, we have three year cycles because the fourth and the fifth year are elections. Enablers of begging. Some of us, our enablers are our family. You can work, so family constantly sends you money, constantly sends you things to support where you are at. Who is enabling you to beg? And I remember one of the first things, because for me, words first speak to me. And I identified two areas that I felt were lame. And I want to speak into one that's easier to explain. And I remembered for a long time in love, I was a lame. I would go to God every day and say, Father, where is the money coming from? You cannot give me assignment and not give me money. And what enabled me to beg was, Every day, the work moved. But when I sit back now, there's so much I've learned around, I've learned around fundraising and, and sort of there are multiple ways to raise finances, that it's not that just students need to pay for a program. There's information I didn't have in short that enabled me to be a beggar. What is enabling you? Sometimes it's well-intended people, friends, communities. When I landed here, the first thing that happened, this second this round for New York, I landed. So when I've come in the past, I've come under the Obama Foundation and we have an elaborate process of receiving you. This time, uh, we didn't have an elaborate process. And so I got into the place I was staying and my phone was not working because the charger had different sockets. And I asked somebody, where do I get a charger? He told me, put on your phone, Google Maps. I told them, my phone is not charging. They told me, find a way to charge it. So I slept because I was feeling sad that nobody can show me where to go and buy a charger. And then I woke up and I switched on my laptop and put the cable to the phone. 
and charged my phone and put on Google Maps and went to look for an ATM. And I remember that story because that became my story in New York. If I need anything, I go to Google Maps, I go and get lost, and I find it. And I remember thinking, I was in Kenya in Africa, we have elaborate processes around people, call them being good hosts. I wonder in what way that enables dependence. How many of us, when we land in a place like New York or other places in the world, you're looking for a hundred people to handhold you? And sometimes it's necessary, but sometimes enable us of begging. Second thing, they were in the temple. You know, can you imagine every day they were going to the temple to beg? The temple. <laughs> the temple to beg. Because they had lost all of the temple. The temple is where the power of God should be greatest. How do we take a man to beg in the temple, at the doorsteps of the temple? We have lost the awe of the temple. And I think in many ways we have. We are a very religious society. And we show up religiously in the temple and beg. I remember the first time I had the assignment of starting Lapi, just before it, I had clarity. Every day I would go to church and every Sunday, you know, that's all the call of what you need to be prayed for, I was standing. I remember a Sunday, I woke up and I told God, we cannot be doing this thing of praying for a breakthrough for 10 years. I need an answer. I had been praying for three months. So I ended up resigning in April, had from God resign. But I didn't know what I was going to be doing. Like I didn't have clarity of what I was going to do. And in those three months, I had a life group where I talked about the director every day, the things that were not working every day. The day I was praying to God about uh, clarity of what my call was. One day I just woke up and I told God, today I'm just praying for one thing. I don't want to pray for this thing again. That evening, a good friend of mine called me. Very good friend of mine. But we had not talked for a while. And she told me, Esther, I've been praying for you. She didn't know I was struggling, or even I was thinking of resigning. Or anything. And she told me, I had to tell you the place you were in 2012. That's where God is. I can't go into too much detail about it. But I knew the answer. Where are you showing up in the temple every day and begging? That is not the temple. The temple is a powerful space. So ask God, where am I still begging? What is enabling me to keep begging? And in what place has the temple become a place called beautiful? Let me tell you the day you know a temple has lost its power, it's when it's called beautiful. A church is a hospital for sinners to the father to be healed every day. And this temple is called beautiful. It has lost its mission. And lastly, beggars ask for the wrong things. They ask for money. If you listen to this, this beggar tells Peter, give me money. What money he needs? He needs to get out of his lameness. And so where are you asking for money? Where have your eyes, where have you placed your eyes off? And I know this can sound very philosophical, but my prayer is that as you hear this, God reveals to you something that you need to be released from. Because the first movement is movement of self. Movement that I want to talk about is movement of mentors. And we all need a Peter and John. And in this community, we are very blessed. We actually have a Peter and John in the name of a Pep And I'll tell you how. Peter looked straight at him. He sees beyond his immediate need. I am an inventor now. And I get very many stories, prayer requests, conversations. But I have learned to look beyond what I am being told. I want to ask that if there's a space in your life that you feel stuck, 
ask God for mentors to see. Yes. That they may be able to look straight at you. Even when you're asking for money and tell you it is not money you need, money has made you a beggar. Let's go for therapy. Money has made you a beggar. Let's start. Let's stop asking what has God called me to do. Mentors who see. Mentors who refocus sight. Peter looks straight at him and then he tells him, look at us. Stop looking at money. Stop looking at everything else. Look at us. And so mentor who, mentors who can refocus our sight. I'm in a season where I'm really enjoying reading about Ruth and Naomi and sort of the relationship that they had and how in some ways Ruth is a beggar and Naomi in some ways. But constantly Naomi focuses the sight of Ruth. And so mentors who call out courage, rise up and walk. No, I, and this last part, you'll allow me to read it. I won't read it, but then read it in the amplified version. Peter doesn't just tell um, the lame man, silver or gold, do I not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. He tells him that, but also he yanks him up. And so we all need mentors who will not finish with us until we walk. I am of the view that in Kenya, in Africa, we've done a lot of inspiration and there's a season for that. It is time to walk. We need churches, we need mentors, we need institutions that tell us, you have been lame long enough, we have enabled you, rise up and walk. And they seize your right hand with a firm grip and raised him up. And if you have those mentors, honor them, because that's a gift. And the last thing I want to highlight from that class is Peter is healed and he serves. I have a lot of debates and conversations about service in my community. The uh, idea that service is a favor. But I like what the lame man modeled for me. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And that's what a free man does. If you ever might find somebody who struggles with service, you know they are still lame. And if you're here and you struggle with serving men and women who you have nothing to benefit from, you're lame. Those who are healed don't struggle with serving. They don't struggle with following. And that's why this guy wakes up and he follows Peter and John. And they drew others. And because of that, they're evangelizers. And those are three things I wanted to mention around movement. That we need to ask, in what places am I stuck? In what places do I need mentors? In what places do I need to serve? For me, when I think about that, I have a vision that calls us to courage. Courage is calling. And what that means for me, it's courage to reimagine myself. Yesterday, and a part of this week, I battled with myself a lot. When I came to Vegas, one of the first, first instructions I got from God was, I still leave your Kenya phone in New York. My Kenya phone tends to have a lot of the things that are going on in that field. I didn't understand why God was making me leave that phone. In fact, I forgot and I wanted to go back for it and I had read the Lieutenant Nasimu. But the last one week I've been here, we have settled on the principles that will direct the Obama fellows. And I have played such a significant role in that process. We were having dinner yesterday, and one of the guys said, Esther, you are the heart of this process. And I knew that why God asked me to leave the phone behind. I needed to be fully present. But I battled with it a lot. I do well with shrinking myself. 
call it humility. But in effect, if I was honest, fear, fear of being judged, fear of thinking differently because I will always think differently, fear of being elevated, I would much rather sit in lameness. And one of the bigger things happened for me in Vegas, and I prayed a lot about this. Ask God, I want to walk in the power that is in who I am in you. The courage to reimagine yourself. The courage to reimagine service, not as a favor, not as an extractive process where you serve so that the person blesses you, but where you serve because you serve in God's kingdom. And ultimately, the courage to reimagine the possible. And that is a place of movement. I want to give us a minute um, to ask three questions and we will put up some mentimeters to help us with those questions. In which areas of your life are you experiencing lameness? And I want you to think not just in terms of internal, external lameness. External lameness is easiest to identify. But some of us, it's internal lameness. I'm stuck. I'm, stuck. I'm fearful. Where are you experiencing lameness? Name it. I'm a huge fan of therapy and I keep telling people in if I had 10 lives in one of them, I would do a therapy. I'm just a huge fan. Long time understanding the emotional um, enslavement because there's a whole process around action, feelings, thought, and actions. And so if you don't understand feelings, you can't change thought process and you can't therefore change actions. And, and one of the things I've learned over time is the way to tame our feelings. My feelings of fear is name it. There's a principle behind it called name it to tame it. So name that place of lameness. Name it. Name it. Then the next question will be, who and how are others enabling your lameness? People around you who have made your lameness normal, they take you to beg every day. Three, how have you normalized lameness in your life? That it's become such a dear part of your life that actually it's possible you protect it. Courage is calling us. And in what ways can we answer that? So I want us to just do that mentimeter just as a way of reflecting on movement. And I'll give us about a minute or two as we do that. Actually, we'll first be quiet. And so we'll be quiet just to write down in what areas. And my sense as I prayed for this is some of our lameness is in our families. Things that we have normalized, alcoholism that has moved various generations. And we think it's normal. It is not. Rise and walk. And so I want to give us three minutes to reflect on the question, but also to answer on the mentimeter. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about it. So I will camera just for a minute or so to reflect on that. Doctors will help me run the mentimeter. And I think it's also been set up. Um, but a minute, and so it's 11.51. I will be back at 11.53. Reflect on this question and answer this minute.
Good morning, everyone. If you could go to www.menti.com, it will prompt you for a code. Please put in 72182182. Then you'll see this question and you'll be able to answer. All right, we'll give it one more minute. For those who are not here, it's www.menti.com. Put in the code 72182182. You'll be prompted by this question. Please put in your answer and we'll be able to go through it with Esther. Thank you. As we close this, I wanna commit uh, to share this with a pet. I think I might see her later and I hope I do. And we can pray over them. But I want to just combine our faith and play, pray over those who have answered this question. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Save our growth, have we not? I want to speak especially to the one whose lameness is execution. In the name of Jesus, up and walk. The public speaking, I saw it, and I, think, I suspect that many of us that we are hiding. Rise up. Father, we release the sword of the word upon each and every lameness in our lives, Lord. God, we don't want to come to the temple. I don't want to bring these people to the temple to bed, Lord. Not when the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. And so, Father, I appropriate the power of the cross, the finished work of the cross, and release it upon every person who's filled this call in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And I pray the Lord, you would rise up. Mentors will not allow them to remain small. Mentors who will see straight through them. And who will call out the walking. And who will yank them if needed. The Father, where we are so used to being pitied, and so we've learned how to do pity parties. Rise up. We bless you for you've done it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. I want to move. And perhaps we can run this, the remaining part of this um, outside this. And so these questions will also be shared with you guys. You can continue to share them, but then you allow me to move towards movement. And, and Fanny, you'll also share those pointers with me, but I actually fully believe that God has released some of us. I just sense also this, um, understand the why. So spend some time in prayer of why am I stuck? So that you're able to name the real reason of your lameness. And I pray that God raises also mentors who will speak in and through you. But I wanna take us to the next level of this conversation which is around movement. Um, and I want to try and move a bit faster because I'm actually running behind time allocated to me. And the journey I have uh, for us is movement. And I have, I want to say that we've been released from lameness in Jesus' name. And so movement is done. But movement causes us to build movements. And that's why the lame man rises up and he goes around telling people about what has happened. And so I want to talk about building movements. What does it look like for us to build movements? Why movements? And I'll talk about that a bit and just some tools that we can think about as we think about building movements. And ultimately, how do we build movements with operational excellence? And so I want to just use some definitions to speak towards this. And these are just many definitions around movement. And movement is the act or the process of moving and especially changing place or position. That's a movement. And that's why we started with movement because we need to move. We need to change places. We need to change positions. And some of the adjectives that I use to describe movement is slow, slight, moderate, gradual, steady, quick, rapid, significant, sharp, substantial, dramatic. One of the words that I picked from the ILS was we in a season for quantum leaps. Quantum leaps is a physical term um, that used to explain, that used to describe an explainable, supernatural-like movement. And that's the season that we are in of quantum leaps that in the past people used to move in structured way. Now God is just dumping people with, depending on the process that people are going through. Movement is changing locations. And I guess sense that for some of us, the movement that God requires from you is you change locations. I don't know what that means, but I just sense that there's some people who need to move to new spaces maybe houses, but also even locations in terms of towns. Some of us need to move from Nairobi to other towns, but also can. By moving, by doing that movement, that one small movement, you strengthen your muscles, which improves your stability, which improves your balance, which improves your coordination. And the opposite is true. If you're not moving, your muscles become weaker. The way God's kingdom works is everything is built on, you start, you make mistakes, but you strengthen your muscles, you do it again, you improve your stability, you improve your balance, you go and do public speaking in postmasters, you do public speaking for high school girls, over time, public speaking becomes your thing. Movements a group of people with a shared aim or a development or a change that occurs. And that's the space that I want to spend time on. I like hearing from people and I just wanted to hear from one or two of us. What are the tools and tactics that are available to movement builders um, that have expanded hugely? If you think about your journey and sort of the people that you've encountered that you think are movement builders, what do you think are some of the tools and tactics that they have used to expand hugely, exponentially, quantum leaps? And I use these photos to describe builders. I think each of these three people are builders. So three, three images are made up of builders and they represent some of the tools and tactics that we need that are available to movement builders. And I just wanted to hear from one of us, one or two of us, 
what do you see in this image that speaks to you or these images that speak to you as far as the tools and tactics that are available to movement builders? I just wanted to hear from one or two people start um, um, not the only voice that's speaking here. And so if you spoke about public chat, speaking as something that you struggle with, this is your moment. <laughs> um, but even just any one of us, what do you see in these images and what do you think they represent as far as the tools that are available to movement builders? Caroline, and please feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, yeah, so I see uh, visioning, uh, that picture of the guy with the image, like, you know, that building is coming from the blueprint uh, he's holding. So the ability uh, to vision, ability to put it down in a way that can be shared and executed. I think it's one of the tool and tactic. I think uh, movement builders are bold. Uh, movement builders are connectors. Uh, movement builders are leaders. Sometimes where you go, where others are not going and sort of like, you know, trailblazing for others to come. Um, yeah, I see a path here, you know, creating new path. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's not a space. Sometimes it's a path as no one has seen, but you see and you go for it. So I think it's leadership, it's ownership, it's boldness. Mm. It's courage, it's I vision. Love. Thank you. I love that. Maybe one more person. My own favorite pictures of this Maasai ladies. I do not even know why I love it. I, I'm drawn to it. I think for me, what it represents as far as movement builders go is you see the people that people don't see. That movement builders are not just, and I love what you say, Carol, in terms of making the way in places where there's no way in effect, like trailblazing in effect, but it's trailblazing for the unspoken for as well, to make sure that as we build movements, this girl is at the center of our movement. This is uh, what speaks to me in this image. Maybe let me hear from one more person, something that just stands out as you look at these images. Lucy, do you want to speak to it? I think I had you speak for a minute or so. Okay. Uh, I, I, see, uh, I, I see people regrouping uh, just uh, to confirm the direction, getting uh, mm -hmm. help from other people and uh, chatting your way together so that then you can go where, where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to challenge us just to, and I love that, Lucy, the regrouping, because I think movements are about groups of people. I want to bring some few things that I see in those images. And like, to be fair, a lot of things can be seen in it. But I just wanted to highlight a few things that I will keep building on even as we go through this presentation. One of the things I'm convinced is love is the revolution. Um, and love is what allows us one of my favorite verses is if I speak in tongues, but I have no love, I'm like a ding dong. And one of the words that has been crafted by, I think one of the people that I really respect greatly, uh, Dr. Wangia Ndoya, and she talks about love as the revolution, that the big movements are about love. And I see that in those images, I like this book um, about being an illogical influencer. A lot of what you will see in movement builders is illogical, and so just that ability to be able to take the logical and convert it into things that you can work with. Um, the power of we in building movements is something that I see in those images. The power of maps, the power of blueprints, the power of self-awareness and healing in building movements. And I'll talk about that a bit more as we go along. The power of humility and boldness, both together. I tell people one of my the verses that really speak to me, and especially in the season that we are in right now, I have sent you to sheep among wolves. I have to keep this in my mother tongue. Sheep among wolves. Modu among wolves. The father says, I've sent you to be sheep among wolves. 
And the tools that he gives us for being sheep among wolves, because that's the most dangerous place you can be. In. Imagine being a sheep among wolves. But he gives us tools for it. Be harmless as a dove, yet as shrewd as serpents. And there's a whole conversation you can have on those two things. The summary of them is humility and boldness. That you are humble and bold. And if you're either only, it's not enough. We must have the courage to have had conversations. We must have the courage to be humble. And depending on personality, those differ. Like the thing that you need to do differs. The power of leaders in building movements, the power of freedom and responsibility. I was in an American space. I would spend 10 hours in that segment. I just want to say this, and especially for any young people here. There's a big move for freedom, and I believe in the power of freedom. I believe in what God says, that where the spirit of God is, there's freedom. But let me tell you the definition of destruction is freedom without responsibility. Every freedom that God gives you comes with responsibility. So the power of freedom and responsibility in building movement, the power of new justice-driven, people-driven, love-driven movements. Um, Spend quite a bit of time in movement at the moment, all kinds of movements. And to be fair, I can't even make up everything that I would love to cover here. I will not, but I will, um, I'm in the process of creating some content that people can then consume even outside this in a season or movements. Um, and I wanted just to bring these images as well. I just wanted to start this conversation a bit loosely. And I hope you recognize Alki Alki is one of us and Apet Angie's uh, daughter. And just some people interacting here. And what I see in this land often is a land of builders. And in some ways they build well, in some ways they build horribly, but they are builders. I wanted just to, and I, but I just wanted to bring some of the photos up, of the experiences that I'm going through here. And, and on Akaki, who were within um, Harvard a few weeks ago, and the master builder summit that we were having a conversation in. But I wanted just to share some lessons that I picked in that, in those summits that are not the core of this conversation. I was even trying to figure out whether I want to spend time on this, but part of building movements is personal keys. And I just wanted to highlight a few personal keys and I won't go through all of them because it's also time. One of the things that I've learned in this land is if you're going to build movements, you need to make peace with learning. A lot of us have gone through education systems that tell us so many reach and And so we think of, learning as an end, eight for four. But adjusting our minds to learning as a continuous process and being humble enough to be a student of life and curious enough to ask why, why not? I'm currently in a movement that's asking, do we need police or do they need to be defunded? Why do they exist? And a lot of the history of police is they were put together for slaves and watching slaves. And that's the reason when you have um, COVID in the world, our police in Kenya and Nairobi, they will go around beating people during a pandemic. And people are asking, do we need police? Or can communities police themselves? I mean, another separate conversation where we are asking why, it, there's a lot of innovation just around civic spaces. And we're asking, what can, how can we reimagine 911 into a solution that serves not just the elite, but serves everybody within the country? And that's a question of curiosity. But people who build movements ask why, why not? If you're one of those people who are stuck in that space that says things have always been done, you cannot build movements. A lot of movements question existing systems. Movements are built by people who are able to think independently. There are people who are able to step away from enablers who make us dependent thinkers. The way the journey of thinking works is you start as a dependent thinker and a dependent thinker depends on others to think. And so what other people say must be the gospel truth. And then somewhere along the way, you start from your own independent thought. And that is a place where you can be able to start to build movements. 
for time you need to become an interdependent thinker. But a lot of us need to do the shift either from dependent to independent. And that's common, especially in our society, because a lot of systems within our society have made us very dependent, dependent on people to think. But you can't build movements with dependent thinking. How do we become independent thinkers? Building movements is a process of being apologetically ambitious. I was in a, there's a book that has been written and especially for women, it is important. You know, we grow up in a society that almost makes us apologize for our ambitions. And the younger, the young, the bigger that apology. But even later on, how do we become an apologetically ambitious? that I am unapologetically ambitious about building a movement of young leaders in Africa. And I will do it as a woman and happily. Or, and this is a space of just making sure you're not making peace with playing small because of your own insecurity. But embracing unapologetically ambitious. And it could be unapologetically ambitious to build the best family I can build. It could be unapologetically ambitious about it. And yet process oriented. And one of the conversations we're having, we're going through uh, the just New York and Boston and just seeing how much building those guys have done in 17th and 18th years. I mean, in the 1820s, I think they had a subway in, in, um, in Boston. And a part of it is they built it on the back of our people and called them slaves and didn't, didn't pay them salaries. But the other side of that conversation is these people are unapologetically ambitious. I remember a while back being in a school in Vegas and a child who was 10 years old comes and tells me, I wanted to buy some, it was a farmer's market and they were selling some seeds. It was a fundraiser and I didn't want to carry the seeds because I was coming back to Kenya. And so I tell them, I want, I'll give you $10, let's say it was $10. I'll give you $10, but I won't take your seeds because I don't have the capacity to carry them. A child who was seven years old, he refused to my money. He told me, no, Esther, I don't take free money. And I thought, all right. And, and when I interacted with them, I went to the schools. I could hear the American revolution, the American pride. And we have a lot of work to do to document and tell the history of Africa. You know, African history starts with some slavery. And because of that, we are apologetically, we live very apologetically. We move around apologizing for everything subconsciously. Nisisi, let me tell you an example. I remember being lost in this conversation, but in what spaces are you apologetically? Um, I'm being apologetic about your ambitions. There are many problems to be fixed by you. I wanted to give you a toilet example. I will not, because of time, learning to dignify your present with your full self. Um, at this sewing time, there's time for the headache of hustling. I mean, an interesting season. Some days I wake up, I go and I sit in the park. I took a look at people. I take photos. I'm in Las Vegas on courtesy of people's bills. I'm in a hotel that just is God knows what. But I have done a bigger season. And I know that I'm not even a tenth of where I want to go. But just to say, in the process that you are in dignify where you are at with your full self. And then speed and pace matters. Working hard is not optional. I feel like there's a lot of processes that have made us afraid of work. Um, I work with young people and I have those conversations often. Sometimes we are afraid of work and it's almost like we think that we will break. And a lot of the rites of passages that we had in African society were about affirming people that you won't break. You can handle it. And so if God has called you to start a school, you won't break, you can handle it. Go. Um, working hard is not optional. Your father in heaven woke up every day and created. And there's a whole conversation around how work is being looked at now and why that has been a robbery. But I won't go into it. But just to say, your father in heaven works and work is about creating. Don't be afraid. Intentionality matters. Uh, lack of systems breeds corruptions and thrives in lack of systems. But power, justice, and imagination ignited. Some of the things that I'm learning here, some I have elaborated, some I haven't. But they're keys, they're personal keys to building movements. But they're also organizational key, 
keys. And the bigger thing about thinking about a movement is if you're in an institution and you're building an institution, you want to act like an organization, but think like a movement. If I'm, for example, having conversations around young girls and reading, I can build an organization of girls reading. I want to think like a movement. Or if I'm a musician and I'm, I build an organization that builds, that presents music, act like an organization, think like a movement but by create a movement of musicians. When you think about a lot of the organizations that are doing well now, Airbnb, Uber, and the likes, what they've done is they act like organizations, they think like movements. Their job is to ask, how do I replicate what I have in the form of movement? And, and there's some things that uh, make movements important. Um, when you, for you to act like an organization, but think like a movement, have to heal yourself first. <laughs> the reason why God has released a movement of therapy because we cannot um, create if we are not healed. We will be afraid. We will be lame. We will be acting small. You have to heal self to unleash your full God-given power. You stop doing music for Kenya. You do global music because you healed your full self and you're not afraid to bring your full power. You could create human beings with power. The more connected you are to who God sees you as, the greater your power. And our job in building movements is to tap into that power. That when I talk, tap into the power of God inside of me. When I write, I tap into the power of God inside me. I do not write smallness. When I do photography, I tap into the power of God inside me. I've not given you a spirit of fear. And fear is timidity and smallness and inconsistency and fitting in, but of power. The power of God is what is the opposite of fear. So we release fear and we operate in the power of God in love. And I said, love is the revolution and sound minds. Let me say this. You cannot create with fear. You cannot. You need to have a sound mind to create solutions. In the workplace, in business, you need a sound mind. But the barrier of sound mind is fear. And so name your fears and let's do the work of healing those fears. One of the ways that I heal my fears is that I name them to tame them. But the second thing I do nowadays is um, there's a verse, I like God's word, there's power in it. And um, there's a verse that I'm actually currently meditating on. And it's because of what God says, release the sword of the word. I wear the full armor of God. Sword, the sword in those places that I live, what they need is sword, and the sword is the word. I have been crucified with Christ. My fears have been crucified with Christ. My timidity has been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The first step in building a movement is you. You have to be seen. There is no movement with you hidden. And so that means showing up with the power of God in you, being vulnerable, being willing to take risks. Because movements open up people's hearts, minds to new possibilities. Let me say this. There's nothing that has opened me up more than Lapid has. And I... I think I do work called Lapid, but the work called Lapid does work in me. Because, because movements open up people's hearts and minds to new possibilities. If you're called to be a coach, 
act like an organization, think like a movement. Movements are what change the ground. And movements are about collectiveness. They say, who are the stakeholders in this space? How do we work together to build a movement? Movement building leaders bring together a diverse group of stakeholders, including those in and not in traditional institutions, seats of power, to build a vision of the future based on common values and narratives. Bringing together musicians, bringing together people of faith in the music industry, in the art industry. But when I think about the work that Eric does, Eric has built a movement. And, and replicating that in all the spaces that we are in, if I'm running a business of shoes, sneakers, maybe I sell sneakers, who are the stakeholders? Who are the suppliers? Who are the people in the green space who care about shoes? Building a movement with them. And to do that, you need to think very differently. If you're stuck in the space of education planning, you cannot build movements. There's a book that I love, and I met the, found, the writer of it, Imagine Strategy. And if you want to explore it, you can. And it talks about shaping worlds and shaping change. There's a, I want to speak to this, and it's a bit random, but I will go to it because it has been deposited. Hmm. There's a book that I'm reading at the moment around the revolution will not be funded. All the things I read, they're all random and weird. But I, it allows me to step in the place of reimagining the possible because I think that's the place that God is operating in, to heal spaces and unleash the power of healed spaces. And I remember one of the things that he talks about that powerful, I like to reflect on. And I'll use America as an example. It talks about how, um, and I'll actually tomorrow be giving a conversation around it, 80% of Americans live on 9% of the wealth. Yes, 80% of Americans live on 9% of the wealth. 80% of Americans live on 9% of the wealth. I.e., if financial wealth was 100%, 90% goes to 20% of the country. But to Aukuchini, who are 80%, they're left with 9%. Kukula, went to hospital. But the bigger thing for me in that economic pyramid is the people who enable that. And often the middle managers. They are us. <laughs> you know, I, I like the history and I'm intrigued by. Um, collaborators of colonialist home guards. Middle managers are modern day home guards. We cooperate with existing systems that extract from the poor of salaries. And to think differently so that in the workplace we ask how do we shape the world, how do we shape change? How do we change the way our organizations think about money and wealth? How do we build sustainable organizations that are anchored on people, planet, profit, all of them together? How do we be at the forefront of organizations and ask hard questions that say we're making billions? How much are we paying our employees? That's what movements are. They're not pretty. They say, I'm not going to be a home guard. I am not going to be a collaborator of colonizers. And do you need wisdom? Yes. But more than the wisdom you need, you need less fear. And some of the principles that they talk about in sort of emergent strategies, small is good. Small conversations are good. Small challenging of businesses is good. Because small is all we have. When you think about large movements, it's just a reflection of the small. 
And so that's an encouragement for us. See the small you do. If you work with directors and your job is maybe to help them think about building governance systems, how do I incorporate people planet in those conversations, even if it's with two directors? Because if you can't see the small, you will keep leaping from build things to build things. You will miss the whole miracle. And I think about the miracle of what God is doing within LAPI, then we are literally in ground zero. It's that small is good. And then change is constant. Be like water. Invest in your capacity to adapt. One of the things that our education system dropped us is that, and I can't go into too much of it, but we have a lot of education, church, parenting systems that create people for a very structured world. And so every time they change, and you remember what I said about beggars and enablers? Enablers in our environments are often churches, schools, parents, and they make us afraid of change. One of my favorite verses is God goes to church. Christ at age 12 goes to church. And it's that time when the mom finds, oh my God, we left Jesus behind and they find him at 12 seated under the teachers. The Bible says he was asking questions. We go to we consume, to listen. We are afraid to ask questions. We call it honor. Invest in your capacity to expecting your work and your life to change instead of trying to prevent them from changing. Change is constant and very much more at the time that we live in now. It's called a VUCA world for a reason. Volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, it's ambiguous. I am convinced in the next few years we will transition to digital currencies. How? Oh, in between Ukraine, climate, CG pandemics, CG what? Change is constant. Never a failure, always a lesson is one of the principles of emergent strategy. Trust the people. If you trust the people, they become trustworthy. The job is people. Never build a movement outside the people. If you find yourself in organizations that land and give people solutions, put up your hand and say no. Trust the people. They know themselves more than we do. So if I want to create a solution for music, I have a student who is creating an app for Nigerian musicians. His first job is to listen and trust that the people know what they need. Move at the speed of trust. But I want to spend more time on this last one, not a lot, just a little. Less preparation, more presence. <laughs> hmm. In a structured world, we are about preparation. In a VUCA world, we prepare them, then we throw away the preparation. It allows us to move as a spirit of God leads. <laughs> and that's not to say we don't plan, we plan. But the principle in the military, the ones who came up with the VUCA, they said, in a VUCA world, do a strategic plan. When you get into the field, throw away the strategic plan, do what you need to do on the ground. And that's why you need to be adaptable. Preparation has diminishing returns after a while, while presence has exponential returns. Presence listens. Presence engages. Presence questions. The sooner you move from preparing to being present, the better your result. And so as we think about then building movements, there's a process that we need to think about in the process of building movements. There is four phases that you go through. There's the preparation, preliminary movement, there's the forced production, there's the critical instant, and then there's a recovery stroke follows. The process is almost like running and planting and building a house that you first start with preparation. And in this place, you're getting you're in the getting ready position on your marks. It's a posture of learning. It's a posture of keen observation. And many of us, for many years, we've been in the preparation space to move. 
And this is where you unleash the power. You apply force and you perform the task. I want to just say this, and I hear this very strongly for this community. You have been in preparation for long enough. Move. Start. Let it fail. It's called an emergent. It emerges. Preparation, force production, critical instant. And this is the point of no return. It only comes after you've done preparation, production, and that's unleashing your power, unleashing everything that you have, your time, your networks, your resources to build something in your workplace. Stop playing small. Unleash your power. Speak in meetings and say, I do not think that makes sense. And the reason is because of one, two, three. Create content that tells us the way our education has been done is all wrong. Unleash your power. And then you get to the critical instant, which is the point of no return. At that point, it's like the work that's to carry you. And combination of preparation and force production, but also you must rest. Constant recovery. This, some of us are very poor at. Finish it off, rest to prevent injury. I remember 2018, I was exhausted, significant. And that was part of the reason I was quitting. I'll never forget something a friend of mine told me, Caroline, and she told me, Esther, rest, don't quit. And I've learned to do that. I, I listen to my body a lot. I listen to my spirit a lot. I don't do very well with it still. I still have a long way to go with it. But I'm learning that rest allows me to start the process again, which is prepare, force production, which co instant, and recovery. Which phases of movement are each of these people, if you were to guess? Maybe let me hear from one or two people. I'm just trying to engage just so that I hear from us and I know time is going heavily. And I know I've said very many things and so I'll release us to do a very quick uh, breakout session just to quickly catch what are we hearing. But which phase of movement are each of these people? And then, and then you saw what so we've talked about that the phases of a movement are preparation, force production, critical instant, recovery, when you look at these images, I just wanted to use these images to ask, what do they look like they are in? And therefore then what post, what phase are you in, in building your movement and what's the posture like? But let's start with the first question of, in which phase do we think each of these people are in? Anyone? Uh, Fanny, you want to go? Yeah, um, I believe the last lady is in recovery and follow through. So maybe it's in the middle of the game and she's just taking a breather. I like that. Yeah. And that lady can be in recovery or in preparation. Oh, yeah, it's true. And then, most likely actually preparation because of the way she's looking. She's observing. She's listening. And that's the posture of preparation. And I want you to identify where you are at. And to be fair, actually, she could actually be in the recovery. But I want her out of this place in her recovery. She needs to go and recover in her bed, in her room, and watch some nice things. Which face are you in? And what posture does it require you to do? The middle one. This is a guy who understands force production. He brings his everything to this moment. First production is I am building my everything, my time, my, and yes, with my friends, my people, the brief. You need in force production and another level of energy that a lot of us need to ask God to release. And as I start to wrap up on building movements, 
I want to say that our world is being currently defined by the battle and balancing of two big forces, old power, new power, old way of thinking, new way of thinking. And when we think about the mega shift that Doc has aptly called and prophetically named a few years, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, we are in the process of a transition from industrial age. In many ways, we're saying that straight served us, that didn't serve us as well. In many ways, Africans were saved that age, but let's go. And we're moving from industrial age, what's called knowledge age, which is digital. That's why we have access to a lot of knowledge. But also, we're moving towards the post knowledge age, which says, oh my God, I have too much information. But what do I do with this information? And that's why emotional awareness is a big deal in the time we are in. Once you have too much knowledge, too much information, there is something that needs to be unlocked in the post-knowledge era. And so there's a mega shift going on. But old power was about currency. It worked like currency, besha, money. And it was held by a few people. It's why power in many countries is still held by a few people. Built on the idea that human beings cannot manage themselves, and so you need a few leaders, a few managers. That's old power. And because of that, once they gain the power, they jealously guard it. It's closed, it's inaccessible. I'm the leader, I'm the one who knows it all. But the new power is like a current, Ima, made by many. It's not about one star. How many people coming together, forming ecosystems. We were doing our recruitment the other day and what we were trying to figure out was, how do we tap into the power of universities? Our recruitment is not just us going and advertising, but we have university structures made by many. How do we tap into that? And so new power parades like the current, it's open. It's participatory, it's peer driven. If you're building anything and it's not open, if you're having conversations and you're not inviting people to share their thoughts, it's just you talking. If it's not participatory, if you have a power game that says I am senior and you guys are, first it's colonial, but in addition to it being colonial, it's old. And so like water or electricity, it's more forceful when it charges. The goal with the new power is not to hold it, but to channel it outwards many more. And the question that we must ask is, can we dream it? And, and I'll, it's a video I wanted us to watch, but we won't because I want us to go to our breakout rooms. And what are we, and I want us to spend some time there just asking the question of what are we hearing so far and what does it mean for us? What are you hearing so far? What does it mean for you? And in which stage are you in, in the building of movements? There's a video that I'd have liked for us to watch, we will not, um, and it's going to be shared in the group. But I want us just to pause here now and sort of just go into a breakout rooms. We'll do this in exactly nine minutes. Some of you will not be able to talk, but let's just hear from each other. What are you hearing? What does it mean for you? And in what stage are you in, in building movements? So we're going to release our breakout rooms, but even as we do that, maybe I can take a minute or two to hear from us as I give Fanny uh, a moment to release the breakout room. Maybe let me just get some feedback. What are you hearing so far? I've talked about two things. I've talked about movement, building movements. And in building movements, I've talked about the process of building movements to help us identify where we are at. I've talked about the strategies and thinking about strategies in movements. And to be honest, what I have said is think about them as imagined. You don't need strategies that are well written up front. It will emerge. The work will speak to you. I've talked about um, acting like an organization and thinking like a movement and what that looks like. I've talked about some personal keys from my own life in terms of building movements. And I want us just to go back and just sort of share those thoughts and what is what it's saying to us. And I hear that the rooms are ready. Maybe let me just hear from one person. What are you hearing? And then we will go into our breakout rooms.
Anyone who wants to speak to us, this is what I'm hearing. Caroline? Yeah, I think if I go back uh, to when the session started uh, about being lame and having uh, people situations which sort of like, you know, give you an ability to remain lame, uh, things which are holding you down is something which I'm hearing. So there's always like a ton of excuses. Um, and I think as being Africans, you spoke about Africa rising, but that colonial mentality, the spirit of lacking, like you're a constant um, mentality of like, I just need to survive. So mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's not that a person chooses uh, to be a survivor, mm -hmm. but I think most of us come from where our families and people are depending on us. So sometimes mm -hmm. there's a goal, you want to take action, but you mm -hmm. look back at the responsibilities and they hold you back and remain mm -hmm. late, either doing something mm -hmm enjoying either you're not responding to the call because i think movement building uh, means going into uncharted waters sometimes mm. we don't have this the social soft nate you know to break free and start mm. and and build so i think i think for me that keeps on like you know uh coming but i think it's that time uh where as people of faith uh we need to stand mm. and be reminded what is mm. our identity so i had that very well that we need to overcome the fear, timidity, and just like, you know, really stand in our position as sons and daughters and heirs uh, of the kingdom. And there's so much ability in us. So I think something which I'm taking away is creating spaces for healing, uh, creating spaces with, where people can unleash and unlock the power that is within them. Um, and I think that is very important in catapulting a generation which is of doers, which is of builders. So we just need um, to find something that is you not know, transitioning us from the survivors mode into the doers and builders mode. I love that. And, and also just allow me to say two things um, based on what you just said, Carol. One, Caroline, one is that the way God's kingdom works you will not get everything seated waiting. Two, the power of hand. That you can work and build movements. That in your workplace, in fact, many of us, it's in our workplaces that our movements need to start. And so don't think in or, in terms of either or. Ask God to help you to see the power of hand as you move towards movements. So I want us to move. Differently, and I know this will be a stream, but it's also a moment for us to stretch. So we come back and wrap up. I think I, I'll do the last part in the last section. But let's go to a breakout room. So what are you hearing? Um, you'll have exactly uh, seven minutes and then we'll need to close it. So not many of you will go to perhaps just two, three volunteers and then we come back. Penny, please open it up.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry, the breakout session was really short. So as Esther comes back, maybe we can ask one or two people to share. So lucky for me, it's random. So I'll just select random people to share. So we'll start with Kathy Mengere. And then you'll be followed by Vanessa Kimoro. If you could just quickly share what you discussed in your breakout rooms. Um, thank you very much, Fanny. Um, what, what stood out uh, for us is about um, global, uh, thinking global, and, um, and, and, and also as we are building to, to act like an organization and think like a movement. And the third one would be about um, uh, trusting people because they, in the process, they learn to trust us and getting things done, whether we are afraid or not, and not to fear failure. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Vanessa, you want to go next? Mm, hi, how are you? And hi, everyone. Uh, my apologies, I didn't manage to join the breakout room, but if you can share, someone else can share. Uh, thank you. All right, so Caroline Jerry, were you able to join? Sylvia Mundia, were you able to join? Hi, Penny. Hi, um, yes. Um, sorry. It's Caroline. Oh, okay. Please proceed. Yeah. I had a problem with my mic. So, yes, I was able to join. And what came out of our room mostly was uh, fear, that we should just overcome our fears that God has already directed us. Everyone um, attested to maybe a testimony that God had already shown you the direction and you're the one maybe keeping yourself because of fear. So in our room, mostly it was fear, yeah. Thank you, Caroline. Over to you, Esther. Okay, I think we can pick, that, uh, pick it up from there. And I hear you, Caroline, I think. And maybe a bit of it is spiritual, and, and I'll um, I'll request and start team perhaps to also just um, find a way of giving a bit a bit of feedback around fear because even for me I hear it strongly that we need to re pray against the spirit of fear because it's a spirit and it could be holding us from just moving towards the sound mind, the power, and love. And so this me this feels a bit spiritual, and so I think it would be useful for us to just as a team, pray over it um, again it's the spirit of fear. But I want to, and that God causes us to move. I just feel that fear is a big deal and it's coming through a lot. So let's perhaps pick it to pray on it further. Um, and so operational excellence is the last part that I want to spend some time on. Allow me to pray. Father, I, I submit to you everybody here who has struggled with the spirit of fear, Lord. The word tells us that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. And I sense that it's an enslavement that whose job is to hold us captive. So in the name of Jesus, we rebuke every spirit of fear, every spirit of timidity, every spirit that's holding us captive. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Let my people go that they may worship me. Father, your word tells us that 
Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says to him, let my people go that they may worship me. And Pharaoh fights it. And I sense that, the, that this fear is a Pharaohic spirit. God, you tell Moses that the battle belongs to you. So we release your word upon every spirit of fear that has held us captive and we decree and declare that we will arise and walk. Let us free from that bond which we are. In Jesus name. Amen. And, Father, we, and, and so the last part that we will speak about is around operational excellence. Um, and so we've talked about movement and sort of what building movements looks like. And let me just be honest, building movement is a course that could take us a few weeks. Um, but I just wanted to just cause us to hear one or two things. Um, once we've done sort of the building of the course, I will let us know and anyone who wants to engage in it and be able to engage in it even further. But I want to end with sort of a conversation around operational excellence. And this is an emerging thing that I hear though. I was in Kenya in January, and this was one of those things. So I hear through the repetition, takes me to go away. It comes and it bangs until I hear it. And so something that kept coming through. And so we movement. Some of us are in building movements, but some of us have already built, started building movements. How do we build those movements with operational excellence? And, and the first question that then we sit with is what is operational excellence? And it's the point at which each and every employee, every team member can see the flow of value to the customer and fix that flow before it breaks down. And so when I think about um, the example that comes to mind is actually KFC. I really like how when you're going to buy the, the fries, there's a flow that, that you work with. And operational excellence is the point at which each and every employee can see the flow. There's a flow. And even when it breaks down, that employees, team members are able to fix it. And so that's sort of the kind of thing that we're talking about in operational excellence. And when you think about it in your life, it is their flow. And when it breaks, am I able to bring it? And there are many frameworks that have been used to have conversations around operational excellence. And one of the ones that I want to spend some time on is called the Shingo model. The Japanese are very big on operational excellence. And they're constantly asking the question, what does it look like for us to build Toyota cars in an efficient and yet good quality kind of way. And that's what gives birth what is called the Chingo model. And it's named after a Japanese um, who pioneered the Toyota production system. I was in a Japanese restaurant very recently and the Japanese efficiency is even in restaurants. You put in a box, you explain to this is how the food works. You press this button, <laughs> the menu comes in. You press this button, they pick up your menu and you and the food comes in. And when you're done, there's a button that you press and the, and the plates are picked. Efficiency in doing things. Um, I want to just share one last example just to bring this point home. I remember I will not name the bank, but I remember coming home and because I guess part of it was good, I was just working on this whole conversation of operation efficiency. And I went into a bank and I was doing a very minute thing. And I remember waiting for 30 minutes for this minute thing to be done. I went to Safaricom. And then Safaricom asked me for another letter from this bank. So I went back to the bank, I spent another hour on the most minute thing, break the flow. Operational efficiency is about what does it look like for us to see where our flow is breaking and work on it. The video that we were supposed to watch, I'm not sure we'll have time, is around a clinic called Cleveland. And Cleveland is one of the largest hospitals here, yeah, the second largest hospital. And they have this thing around wait time. And they ask, what does it look like for us to have a flow that reduces the wait time of patients? And so operational excellence is the place we want to land in as we build our movement. It goes back to first principles of why are you here, who do you serve, and what do you stand for? And so that's the place I want to spend time on. And people talk about operational efficiency. The example that's often given is around the Ferrari and how I think right now you can do a change, the changing of the tires in a Ferrari a Formula One kind of um, space in about 1.25 seconds. And, and what people ask is, what does it take for a, a car to come and stop 
in a place and it's checked in 1.25 seconds. Because if you do more than 1.25 seconds, you make that driver to move in a slower speed. So you change the tires, you check the water, you change the rooftop in 1.25 seconds. Operational excellence is um, around that. And there's some, there's some thoughts I want us to sit with as far as organizational excellence, operational excellence. For any organization to be successful long term, for any content creator to be successful long term, for any musician to be successful long term, for any employee to be successful long term, you must engage in a relentless quest to improve. One of the bigger philosophies of operational excellence is improvement is anchored in operational excellence. And improvement is hard work, but the alternative is not something that you want to do. And there's no middle ground. And so the first principle of building towards organizational excellence and yourself is constant improvement. Constantly saying, how am I doing my work? How long does it take me to finish reports? How long does it take me to engage my team? How do I improve on that? And that's why you have 360 feedback systems. The goal of those is for any organization individual to be successful long term, you must engage in a relentless quest to improve. And this is something that we apply to in Lapid 247. There's no cohort that ends without me sitting and asking. Sometimes I have to even write, what did we do well? What do we need to do different? In a week, what did I do well? What do I want to make sure next time I do differently? When I landed, I was struggling with a subway. And I, every time I would get lost, I'd still ask, okay, what did I do well here? What do I want to do differently? So continuous improvement. More than the application of a new tool or a leader's charismatic personality, organizational improvement requires teams that are humble, engaged, and empowered. There's an article that I love. It's written around mastering leadership. Uh, a teacher whose name I've forgotten. But one of the things that he talks about is you cannot improve if you're not engaged. You know, a lot of us, we work because of salary. Not improve if you're not invested. Get another job. You might be getting away with working bare minimum, but you're killing your spirit and you're killing your capacity to build. So ask father for another job if you're disengaged. Or, or if he's not giving you another job, ask, how do I engage here because the work of organizational improvement needs you to be humble, humble enough to say, I didn't do that well, but engaged as well to be able to say, I could, I'm invested. I'm not giving half of myself, but my full self in this process and empowered enough to say, if it's going to change, no one else is going to change it. It is me. Sustainable results require culture in which every person is involved in making improvement every day. The Chinko model provides a powerful framework designed to guide the transformation of culture. Another thought that comes through as you think about organizational culture that drives organizational excellence. And the point here is just summary. Organizational excellence is the fruit of organizational culture. If you look at any space where excellence is a problem, what you want to dig is the culture. If you look at a problem of personal excellence, what you want to dig is your own personal culture. So whether an organization's objectives are financial or altruistic, the focus of all people must be on results. The big principle around organizational excellence is what are the things that matter to us and how are we measuring them? And so organizations design systems with the intent of achieving specific results and they select tools to support those systems. And I'll talk about that in a short while. And when one system or tool doesn't achieve target results, executives try to modify current systems, implement new tools in the hope of reaching that target. Tools and systems alone do not operate, but business people do. And that's why it's organizational culture drives organizational excellence. And so each person within an organization has a set of values, a set of belief systems that influences the way they behave. And so ultimately the aggregate of people's behaviors makes up organizational culture and therefore then ends up making the organizational results. That is perhaps a summary of everything I will say as far as operational excellence goes. These are the three, three things that the Shingo model is built around. The one, ideal results require ideal behavior. Purpose and systems drive ideal behavior. Principles inform ideal behavior. Let me start with the first one. 
if you're running an organization, you're running a department, if you're running your life, and you have not defined ideal results, you cannot have operational excellence. Operational excellence starts with defining what does ideal look like. And so if you watch the video for Cleveland, we defined that we want a four minute waiting time for our patients. Ideal results must be defined. And so when you're in your organization, when you do content, do you have ideal results? That our ideal results is to reach a thousand people with each content that we create. Define it. Let me say this. Kenyans, we are creative. Um, if we were to name our bigger gifts, it's creative. We are very good at working with small to create. We're good. That's why we are called hustlers. I don't like that name, but let's go with it. We can create. But to create movements, we have to think in systemic ways. And systemic ways act with what does ideal result, not activities. Don't do any activity without defining what ideal results look like. And for us, for example, for me, I have clarity of we are doing a cohort. What does ideal result look like in terms of the numbers that we need to get from that cohort? And when we are less than that, I look at everything. But it's because I have defined ideal results. What's ideal results for you? The second thing, ideal results require ideal behaviors. If I define that it will take me four minutes to have, I want patients to take only four minutes in this hospital. That's inspirational. To me, my inspiration is not enough. So I have defined my inspiration. I then ask the question of what ideal behaviors do I need to have in place to achieve those ideal results? And so that's that principle there, that ideal results require ideal behaviors. You cannot achieve ideal results based on pep talk. They need ideal behaviors. And then purpose and systems drive behaviors. If we don't have purpose, big why, but even more importantly in our context, systems, tools that drive behavior, you will never achieve the ideal results. And so in that video, you can see how they put together systems. And their systems, for example, is they have an app that monitors. When you walk in, you're given a card. And that card says you've walked in at 9.05. If you're at 9 or 9.11 or 9.12 and you've not been served yet, that card goes to red. Then it starts to flash on various people. That's a system that ensures the ideal result is achieved. And then ultimately, principles inform ideal. And so that's what the operational excellence is in summary. The results of an organization depend on the way its people behave. behave. To achieve ideal results, leaders must do the hard work of creating a culture where ideal behaviors are expectant and evident in every team member. Have you defined ideal results? That our ideal results is we want to make sure that we serve 100 people per day. To do that, our ideal behavior is that we are engaged and we listen and we are engaged. Or it's content. Our ideal results is a thousand people need to see our content. Our ideal behavior is that we own our content. And then what tools do we need for that? We perhaps need tools for spreading the content and sharing widely. And then you build dashboards that you monitor. How many people have we sent into this content? And that allows you to monitor whether you're achieving your ideal results. It has long been understood that beliefs have a profound effect on behavior. What is often overlooked though is the equally profound effect that systems have on behavior. Most of the systems that guide the way people work are designed to create a specific result. And the lack of a system is a system. And so if you have specific behavior you want, you must have systems that to drive that behavior. And then principles inform ideal behavior. And so just to spend a bit more time on ideal results and speak some, some words into it, focus on most leadership is on what many consider to be key responsibility and so your results. 
And that's your ideal results. And to say in whichever movement that you're building, name what's important to you. So for example, for us, we have ideal results for recruitment. We have ideal results for our programs. So for example, for our programs, we have a target to make sure at least 80% of our participants transition to the next pillar because we have several pillars. If we start to see people are not showing up to class, drop out and we will be at less than 80%. And we have dashboards that we use to monitor attendance. Then we know our ideal result is at risk. And so we start to ask what has changed, what do we need to put in place to correct this? And so you need to define for your movement, what are your ideal results? An organization must have performance results to succeed. Value needs to be considered from the perspective of the customer rather than from the enterprise leadership. And once you've defined those ideal results, put them in a scoreboard. I remember going to Cleveland Clinic and just sitting under the management and watching how they have dashboards that that's all they watch. And because of that, I, there's a, and I got NYU, some guys to create for us dashboards for rapid. And the reason for that is people need to see measurement points. So for your movement, if it's in content, have dashboards that you watch every day. My content is only reaching 100 people, which is fine. I want it to reach a thousand people. What do I need to do differently? The more you visualize those measurement points, the more action results from it. So visualizing makes it clear what is important. Hang a whiteboard with measurement points on the wall of all departments, if it's in your own personal life. Define your ideal results, watch them. It's what a prep has been doing with us when he, she asks us to define our visions and take the measurement points to existing platforms such as the daily startup meeting, weekly performance meetings, create measurement points. So have scoreboard, but also have measurement points. And sometimes it's a meeting with yourself. I've had very many meetings with myself that say, hey, is it programs? Why are we not growing? How many students are we reaching? Why are we not having conversion at, at our target level? So have those meetings. And then ideal behavior only through ideal behavior can we achieve results. A behavior is observed, described, and recorded. For it to be a behavior, it must be observable, it must be describable, and it must be recordable. And therefore, it's an action. It's not an inspirational thing. It says my ideal result is 20% increase in recruitment uh, leads every month. That's my ideal results. What action will get me to that? That's your ideal behavior. And my action that's observable, I will have five videos or five um, meetings with students that are observable, describable, and recordable. And so I will do the first meeting and do minutes. The second meeting, do minutes. And at the end of the month, I'll ask, have I achieved my results? No, or oh, yes. Did my behavior support that or where did I miss it? And so you need to make sure that each of your ideal behaviors are observable, describable, and recorded. And I have an example here. Our team members know our vision and mission. Our team members understand our vision and mission. Our team members talk about our vision and mission at the beginning of every meeting. And I was going to ask you if this is an ideal behavior. Maybe let me ask, which of this would you say is an ideal behavior? Is it our team members know our vision and mission? Is that observable? No. They are both, but it's not observable. So that is not an ideal behavior. Our team members understand our vision and mission. Can you observe it? Can you describe it? Can you record it? If it's not, it's not an ideal behavior. But if we can say our team members talk about our vision, maybe we can say that it's possible for us to observe that. We can see them talking about our vision and mission at the beginning of every meeting. Um, we can record it. We can record this part of the minute. Esther talked about the vision and mission. And so we're able to say Esther Moniki understands the vision and mission. The point there being ideal behaviors are observable, describable, and recordable. And so as you think about your ideal results, remember, Ideal results are great, 
But what drives ideal results is ideal behaviors. I won't go to that because of time. The second thing is systems and tools are successful. Entrance price is usually made up of complex systems that can be divided into layers of subsystems. And so when you're thinking about when you're thinking about tools is the how. So I have, uh, I, I won't go into that, but it's to say I have an ideal result of I want to recruit 100 students. I have an ideal behavior, which is that I have meetings with student leaders every month. And then I have a tool that measures that. And so I put in place a system that captures every time student leaders walk into our space. In this case for clinics, it's that they build an app to monitor every time a patient walks into a hospital. When you think about the bank where I was there for 30 minutes, the gaps were in ideal behaviors and in tools. Who is monitoring how long I walk in? Now this, you're given a sleep. But what does that sleep help with? If there's no system that says Esther has been here for an hour. In that example, you see they even created floor managers. And floor managers are people who go to the floor, like in the patient's area, and start to bring on board people and say, our system is showing we are lagging behind. Let's increase the people in the reception area. Let the floor managers manage the going in and out into the hospital. Tools, practical tools and systems that are used to monitor our progress. I wanna end with what we call the shingle guiding principles. And I know my time is almost up, but I will make sure I'm done in the next five minutes. What ultimately all that I've talked about is built about is if you're building a movement, seek perfection. I know we are afraid of perfect. I am, especially if you're melancholic, I'm very afraid of perfection because this is a process I've had to go through to heal from perfectionism. But building movements, one of the principles is you need to seek perfection. It serves as an inspiration because you will never get perfect. But it means that you're constantly improving. And so one guiding principle, seek perfection in whichever movement that you're building. To embrace scientific thinking. And scientific thinking is about experiments and learning from those experiments and recording those results. That's the art of scientific thinking. Start, learn, record, start, learn, record. And that's why you need to be very adaptable because that's what allows you to see what is working and what's not working. Lead with humility. Humility is an enabling principle that precedes learning and improvement. Focus on processes. Constantly ask what in the process is breaking the flow and fix that. Don't blame, but go back to them. And then try and assure quality at source. They say the perfect quality can only be achieved when every element of work is done right the first time. So the first time we do our recruitment, how do we get it right? The first time that we release content, how do we get it right? What systems, what calendars do we need to have in place? What's your quality? And then think systematically. What is working, what is not working? That's the journey that has taken us. Movement. Movement. I want to invite you guys to our programs. I will run. We will share them with you guys. There's a class that we want to start. It's called Crossroads. I know it's a lot. Um, but I just wanted to throw some thoughts at us um, and then use that to sit with what would make sense for us. I wanna take one or two questions. I know I probably have run um, quite a bit into your time, but I think I have about eight minutes, but we could use maybe five minutes. Eric can advise me. We can, I can pick questions um, and then release us to go and sit with us. Eric? Wow, yes, uh, thank you, Esther. We have some time for some questions. So uh, feel free to ask your questions. You have access to someone who is anointed, please, guys. This is your chance. Ask any questions that you have, and Esther will gladly answer them. And even thoughts, I, I would love to hear from us just anything that is in your spirit. I personally think we're in a movement, a moment. Movements are created from moments, and I know we're in a moment. Um, so let's talk. Let's spend five minutes talking. Forget everything I said. Let's. Yeah. Hi, Esther. I just have a question here. 
So someone is asking, is it possible to grow an organization like Lapid Leaders organically to maturity without external funding? And what are the pros and cons? Mm, that's a good question. Yes, I had zero funding, but from the father. I remember in 2018, when I was on rest, um, one of the first things, the strange things that happened was there was an organization called Africa Leadership Institute, a Ford Foundation grant grantee did a study of the leading leadership development programs in Africa. They identified three in Kenya, Kali, ELF, and Blackwood. And they called me and said, Esther, we love the work that you're doing. We want to put you in this report. Please tell us who funds you. And I told them I have zero funding. And in my head, I said, I have the funding of the Lord. And they couldn't understand how we had done what we had done without funding. That's to say that start and build with excellence and keep going with what you have. Don't depend on, there are people who are blessed enough that when you start your funding. Me, the way I know God, start. The advice I would give you, funding comes. That said, one of the things I have learned in this process of this fellowship is there's a lot of resources in the world that we don't have access to. We need to figure out how do we access them faster. The one thing in which I did, and I trust God's processes, I have no idea I got here at the right time. But the thing I've committed to, and I do this a lot with Lapid guys, is they will get there faster. It's a lot of funding. Um, but we're not exposed to it. Um, and we're not exposed to the conversations that ignite funding. Um, and that's what this is about. So in summary, that, yes, it can grow organically. Uh, Jesus has built greater things. Um, but also just expect, expand your mind. Don't be closed. Ask God, what are the opportunities that I can also tap into? I hope I've answered. I see Caroline. Okay. Can Caroline, you can go through. You can ask. Yeah, I, I just wanted to contribute to that. Um, I've had a privilege to work in philanthropy space and I want to testify. I think something that um, everybody needs to do, including myself, is start exactly how the story of Esther, where you have started and then someone finds the story and they start investing in the story. Um, so for post in the group, uh, I'll be very happy to share some of those, but I work in funding spaces and I agree. There's so much money, but there's a disconnect and maybe we're not building enough movements uh, to locate where the money is coming from and how to seek and find it. And especially now, there's a study that was done recently that said the funding that startup funding that has been released in 2022 in Africa is like for 2021 and 2022 years in one. And you know that's true when you start to know people who have access to that funding. Um, so start, build the movement, uh, build the movements, collaborate with people, imagine strategies, and over time, and explore. Let's not say funding, we will wait a partner that has released those resources. So let's go for them as well. Um, as I have one more question, it's been posted. Mm -hmm. um, how can I start my journey of movement from a job I've done for eight years? Where do I start? Um, so the person feels like they're losing time and you know growing older. So where mm. does someone start? Yeah. Mm. Start at God's feet and ask, where do you want me? I know, I know that sounds very philosophical, but honestly. Start at God's feet and ask him, where do you want me? And if he says, get out, get out. If he says, stay there, stay there. Um, but I hear you say, I sense that your, something in your spirit has been activated. You're supposed to be out. I don't know why you're not out. Deal with the fears. Um, and also, God is never late. I, 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 yeah.
All right, thank you, Esther. Oh, Lucy Njoroge, please unmute your mic and ask your question or comment. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Esther. The, this uh, topic of uh, operational efficiency, I'm just thinking of many of our young people who feel stuck in their workplace and they're not able to make a change because they don't feel that they have, uh, <laughs> they, they, know, they say, so what would you say to these young people who are feeling stuck and uh, you know, they, there's no job so they can't move out and yet they can't begin to change what is happening around them because maybe they have a boss who will not look at that very positively. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your comments? So first let me honor Lucy. Lucy has been a big part of my community and prayers for many years. I still remember Lucy coming to, uh, where our office is, why I'm praying with me. Lucy, I honor you. Thank you for being part of my movement. Um, though, there are many things to that, there are many parts to that question. One is operational excellence is in your personal life. It's not just in organization. And so to be able to say, what does ideal results mean as an employee who is working under somebody else? And perhaps ideal results mean I earn the trust of my boss. One of the things I was taught very early on in my career is earn the right to speak. And we talk constantly say this often, but the king is the king is something that many young people need to learn. Um, Esther has to approach the king in the way the king is. And so though maybe the ideal result of that person is I will learn how to lead my boss and to earn the trust of my boss. And define that in a way that you're able to measure it. Um, and, and so to say that my ideal result, my ideal behavior is I will have feedback meetings with my boss every month and ask what I'm doing well, what she'd like me to do, and more importantly, how I can help her do better her job. And so it's expand your conversation for operational excellence beyond the things to your current place of influence. That's there. Lucy, I don't know if I've answered your question. Yes, you have. I, I think it's very powerful uh, what you have brought in, especially the example of Esther, where gain uh, the, 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 you know, trust, you know, work, get, get your, your process trust. I think that is very powerful. Yeah, and I, I think I like Esther's example. So thank you so much. I'll be able to share that with the young people. Thank you. Maybe we can have one last one because I think our time is just sort of a bit gone. Um, Ofeni, do you want us to yeah. close? No, there's a question. I'll, if you could just answer this one before we close. Yes. How do we reciprocate the same movement in our children so that we have a generational movement, one that shifts and not just moment by moment? Oof. Let me first celebrate that question. I will tell you many things. I would tell you many things, but I want to tell you just one thing. Liberate your children. Liberate your children to question you. Liberate your children to speak. Liberate your children. <laughs> um, one of my, the books that I love is written by, it's The Jewish Phenomenon. And they talk about what enables Jews to be 2% yet they own 60% of the American economy. And they talk about one of the things, one of the many things, but one of the many things is, is that, that book will help you with parenting, but one of the things is a, a Jewish mother's greatest moment is when they can argue with their son or daughter in such a way the daughter wins. See your kumpatia, the daughter wins an argument. And because of that, the best lawyers in the world are Jewish. Liberate your children from fear. That's called honor. Those are your own issues that you need to deal with. Your children can speak to you and, and be respectful and yet have the capacity to question you. Liberate children, number one. Number two, give them a strong sense of who they are. Anchor them in their identity. So Jewish people 
are anchored on their history. And they talk about how God has released us from the Red Sea, how God has fought for us even in Holocaust. He will do it again. What is the history of your people? Are you sharing it with your children? Are they able to say our people? One of the biggest thing my mom has given me is I have a history of women in my family and they do. And that identity, that's why God tells Israelites, put memorial stones that your children may see. In Africa, we have a thing that says, we're trying to be American. You will never be American. You will never be British. You're African, own it. And owning it, you know, I hear sometimes among middle class parents talking about my children can talk English, they can't talk their mother tongue, baby. <laughs> Your children, their culture, don't rob them their identity. Choose one of them if you're from mixed marriages, choose one of them, but anchor them on a history that they can be able to say, I am. Do those two things only. Liberate your children to speak. Give them a strong right Can we end there, please? I, it is 1.30 on this end. I have another thing at 6 a.m. So I need to do literally four hours. Um, but it's been an honor and a privilege to have talked to us. I pray that God looks at his word and that the seeds that we've planted here continue to grow. I pray that he leads you into the place of movement, in the place of building movements in your family, and ultimately to do it with Operation A. And allow me to pray, and then perhaps after this, allow me just, Eric, I will literally, I'll have to exit immediately. I say amen. So, Bob, in the door, what is waiting for me? Just allow me. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation and for allowing me to extend your time. I'm grateful. And may God continue to bless the ministry. I pray that it continues to reach many more and that it becomes a movement of unstuck. Mm. I remember one of the things that released me was unstuck conference in 20. And so may God help us to figure out how do we take unstuckness to our children, to slums, to villages. Let's get the movement. Father, we, we bless you for, for your love, for your goodness, for the moments that become more movements, Lord. We don't take them for granted, Lord. Thank you for the seeds that you gave me, Lord. I have planted them and I have watered them and I know the team will continue to water them. But Lord, only you, God, is able to grow those seeds. So, Father, I release them to you and I ask that God, every seed that we planted here may continue to bear fruit generations to come, Lord, for the honor and the glory of your name. That, Father, we may be able to say we stood in the moment and said yes. And you sent us to the nations, sent us to our families, sent us to our workplaces to shine your light forth, to arise and shine for the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. We love you, Lord. We consider it the greatest privilege of our lives to serve in your kingdom. So use us even more, Father, to do the things that you desire to do on earth, that we may be able to say the kingdoms of the earth have become the kingdoms of all. We love you, Father. We thank you for our families. We decree blessings over every family represented here. We decree freedom and liberation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Let's celebrate Esther. I think she has, Amen. She has done an amazing, amazing, Amen. amazing, amazing. amazing.